Hi everyone, I'm Rochelle Rosario and today I have with me Layla from LPTMS Layla Please Tell My Story and Liberty Una CIC. She is an incredible domestic abuse advocate, survivor, public speaker, documentary maker, podcaster and community leader. So I'm very grateful to have you here again. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming over today. Jack of all trades, <laughs> master of none. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so last time I made a rookie mistake and only realised halfway through that Layla's mic wasn't working. You can put it, you should put the blooper in. I'm put the blooper in yeah, right now. In. And we're like, why is the mic not green? <laughs> why is your one blue and my one's green? You've not told me it's not been recorded. No, maybe it's just a... <gasps> Don't worry, because I'm sure it would have picked up from my one. No. So that is the reason why you will see a, a, a transition between part one and part two. So let's get started again. Mm. <laughs> right. When did you first go to therapy? So I, um, I've been in therapy for nearly five years. I started therapy in August 2019. And um, whilst I was still in a relationship with a perpetrator. And the reason why I actually went to therapy was because I thought I was going mad. Like, I thought I was going crazy. I thought that I was the reason why my marriage was failing. Because that's what he would say. Like, he'd mm. say, our marriage is failing. It's your fault. And, you know, you're the reason to blame. And it's your anxiety. It's your depression. Like, I'm walking the nature because of you. And I really believed it. Like, I genuinely thought I was going absolutely insane. And that was the reason why the marriage was failing. Um, and why I was being abused. Mm. It's like typical gaslighting, isn't it? Uh, well, I know that now, but I didn't know it yeah. time. I know that now. I say that with such clear mind not now because hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah, but yeah. when you're in it, you just don't know. Um, so, yeah, so I um, reached out in my local area and Googled to find a therapist thinking, oh, you know what? This must all be because I had a really traumatic birth um, with my daughter. It must be because I had a really traumatic um, childhood. And I thought that's what I was blaming it on. And whilst it had a big part to play in it, it really wasn't the re I wasn't crazy. What mm. I was experiencing was domestic abuse. So anyway, so I reached out for a trauma-centered um, therapist and did all my research um, in the area. Um, and I got really, really lucky in the sense that the first therapist I found happened to be the, the one, like, was the therapist that I would continue doing the work with. You know when you say found, so was he the only person you actually spoke to over the phone first? No, 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 I spoke to many different therapists over the phone. Um, so you go like online and they have a directory of where therapists are um, registered with, they've got like their own association. Like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So that's how I found it. I found it through the directory because I didn't want to just be getting like any old Tom Dick of Harry off the street who wasn't qualified and wasn't registered and things like that. And that's really actually really, really important for anyone who's looking for a therapist is just to make sure they do their research. Um, and also I knew for me, even though in that clouded head, thinking that I'm going crazy, I knew that I needed a therapist that could work through trauma with me. Mm. Um, so anyway, so Fountain got really, really lucky that he just happened to be the one, like the therapist for me. Um, and I was able to build a relationship with him. Um, I mean, it's taken a long time for the relationship to develop and grow into what it is now. But from the moment I met him, it was like, okay, something, this feels good. Like the, the vibe feels good. Like yeah. I might have not necessarily felt safe straight away, but he was just really open and he was really patient and... Um, Green flag. Yeah, absolutely. Like there was all these, he was just nothing that I had experienced from an adult male mm. in my life before and so it just felt it felt something felt good and I thought okay let me stick with this and let me see how it goes and you were saying um in your stories recently oh no actually I wanted to touch base on the gaslighting because mm. you said that your ex made you feel like it was your mm. fault mm -hmm. so when was your light bulb moment like when you when you started to realize it was through your therapist right Wait, yeah so like as in like when I realized like oh it wasn't God, what's fault. happening is actually domestic abuse and yeah, yeah. And I'm not going crazy so it was like there was no big massive aha light bulb moment it was like a, a, a build-up of Little different things, things. Oh, okay. so 
the year previous, I had gone to Kosovo and taken Bella for the first time to Kosovo. And, like, it was her first ever trip to Kosovo. I remember going and thinking, I don't miss him. And I feel really good being here away from him. But I then I immediately was like, oh, my God, what a shit girlfriend. Like, what, what a fiancé. Like, we were engaged at the time. Like, what a shit fiancé. You can't think that about your partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I remember, like, on the way back, and also, um, sorry, ADHD, so now it sounds like I'm all over the place, but you're triggering yeah. memories for me. <laughs> so also, uh, aside from that, I actually remember going um, on a Hindu on a girl's trip um, to Marbella. There was, like, a big group of girls. It was, like, 20, 30 girls um, for my friend's Hindu. And it was the similar feeling that I had on that Hindu. And both the both the Marbella um, trip and the trip to Kosovo were quite close together. And um, I just remember feeling so free mm. and thinking, like, I don't want to go home. Like, I don't want to go home. But again, I just buried the feeling and I thought, no, this is really horrible. You cannot think this about your partner. So um, instead of thinking, oh, why let am me explore I... this, right? And yeah, this is yeah. why therapy was incredible for me, because instead of me ignoring that feeling like I did back then, therapy helped me explore it like in a safe way like don't ignore it like let's see why do we feel like this like why do we feel like this why do you feel like this um and sorry i've got really itchy nose one second it looks like i fucking do cocaine <laughs> oh, <God. Keep> going. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i was even just ignoring the feeling burying my head in the sand thinking no absolutely not like i'm um, why am I feeling like this? There must be something wrong with me, right? Because, you know, they're getting married soon and there's no way I could be feeling like this about the man that I'm about to marry. And so that kind of seed was planted, I think, then and there, like yeah, yeah, that yeah. summer 2018. And then in December was um, an incident happened in public where he, he wasn't physically violent, but he was really verbally abusive in public. It was like rush hour time and Bella was there and really up until then Bella had never seen she hadn't seen it she may have now what I know about domestic abuse and children witnessing and being victims now I, I think maybe she, there were times where she did hear it okay. um but she had never witnessed it and at the time I thought I've been able to shield her from it that she's never seen her parents in this situation but that day in particular we were on our way into London and we it was long i couldn't top up my oyster card on time at the train station so we missed the train uh but i planned the journey knowing what he's like and knowing how like meticulous he was with timings and getting to places and things like that because that was always like a stressor for me um because of how he was yeah um because if things didn't go his way then it would just be a shit show so i've planned that journey meticulously that day because we were going to a particular event but I planned it so that even if we had missed the first train, the tra- second train would still time. get us there plenty of time. Anyway, so I didn't get to top up my Oyster card on time. We missed the first train and he's just like, it just immediately goes into it. Like literally on the platform, it's rush hour, shouting at me like you're a liability, you're a bitch, you can't do wow. nothing right. Little, anything that you can think of, like it was yeah. said to me. And I just remember thinking... I can't believe you're doing this in front of people. Like, yeah. it was one thing when it was behind closed doors, but now you're actually doing it in front of people and you're doing it in front of Bella. Mm. And that moment, I just, I didn't say anything back. I went and I just sat down on the bench with Bella. And I remember having this, like, this feeling that just came over me, like, I'm turning into my mum. Mm. Because... When I was a child, I used to literally beg my mum to leave my dad for things like that, um, and she never did. And I and there was a lot of like, a lot of trauma comes from that, right? And I remember thinking, oh my god, like now it's starting to happen in front of Bella. What am I doing? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm just repeating the cycle. Exactly. And it was very, I was very much like blaming myself, still thinking I was at fault. Um, but something about that that incident, it being in front of Bella, like triggered something from my child, and I thought. I don't want Bella to be like me. Right. Like, I don't want her to grow up and repeat the cycle of being with people who are perpetrators, right, and ruining her life and being abusive and things like that. And so that was another little thing, like another little okay. seed in my head thinking, I can't believe this happened in front of my daughter now. If I continue this, if I allow this man to keep doing this, I'm fucking my child up. Yeah. And it's 
slowly escalating as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you're going from behind closed doors to now you're in, in public hour, in front of my child. What's next? Yeah, exactly right. Um, and he didn't just stop there. Like it, we were going from the town that we lived in into London. And so, like, what, into London Bridge, like, you can imagine how busy it is in mm. London Bridge at, like, 8 o'clock in the morning, like, he's heaving with people, and he just didn't care, like, he was just hurling abuse at me the whole yeah. way, like, not even the whole way, actually, the whole way on the train, he gave me the silent treatment, oh. then when we got to London Bridge, in front of everybody, just calling me names, and, like, making this big show, and it was just a whole, it was just a nightmare, it felt awful, I'll never forget, actually, because when we then ended up getting to the place, to the event that we were going to, um, and I guess like he settled into the environment and he just went, oh, well, at least we made it. So give me a kiss then. And I was like, no. And that was the first time I'd said no. Yeah. Did you, do you know what you just did? Yeah. No, I'm not doing that. And so I guess that like, there were parts of me that were slowly like defying the abuse okay. or like, you know, fighting back against it very unknowingly. But I guess that's what I was doing in, in, in attempt to try and regain my own power. Um, and then, you know, after that, we, we still ended up getting married. Mm. Like, even though these things were happening, I still ended up going through the wedding. And um, Is that because you've <clears> got <throat> the hope that it will get better? Or that... Yeah, well, I can't really say yes to that, because also at the time, I, I still wasn't aware that it was domestic abuse. abuse. So they thought it's normal. Yeah, I just is... thought, oh... Um, you know, he doesn't hit me every day. Like, it only happens, like, a couple of... When he hits me, it's only a couple of times a year. But when he hits me, I end up with scars. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, when he's not... it's They're not minor violent incidences. Not that any incidents is less... You know, like, is he right? Exactly. Like, there's no... Like, no one gets a trophy for being the most abused. Like, it's bad regardless of how abusive it is. Um, but in my head, I genuinely... You know, like, we talk a lot about... I, I say it a lot about the Trevor and Mo from EastEnders. Do you remember like Trevor would come home? Oh, from little the pub Mo. Just, yeah, yeah and, like, like big. Oh no, 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 little Mo. And, like Trevor would come home from the pub and just slap her. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. thought that's what domestic abuse was, and then we used terms like domestic violence, which is why I don't use the term domestic violence anymore. Why I use the term domestic abuse because when we just attach the violence to it, we think that's all it is. You don't think of the gaslighting, financial the, abuse, yeah, coercive the, control, right, exactly the trauma bonding, the gaslighting, mm. the economical abuse, the things like maybe some abusers might use um, turning the boiler off so that the victim can't then have a shower, yeah. can't turn the heating on, turns off the electric, so can't use a washing machine, can't use a dishwasher. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, all, there's so many different forms of abuse that because they're not a, a physical act of violence to the victim, no one would actually pick up that it's abusive. And that's what I thought at the time. I thought, well, he doesn't hit me every day. Like he doesn't, like, he doesn't do it in front so of other people. So it could be worse. It's not that bad. It could right, be worse. Right, exactly. It could be worse. And then I think, well, you know, I'm strong. I stand up for myself. I defend myself. So I'm not a victim. But, yeah. And again, that word victim has all those taboo attached to it because people really hate being attached or, like, associated to the word victim when actually, in essence, it's just a technical term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were a stranger in public and you were attacked, you'd be a victim of the if crime. You, that's what I say to people. If they, if there was a burglary, yeah. If your business was burgled, you're a victim of that crime. It's not yeah. that you're, you know, when I think it's people missing, not misinterpret, but um, that have that stereotype of like, oh, getting the violin out, you're playing the victim, yeah, or stuff right. Like that, when it's like, yeah, no, absolutely. it is a technical. It is. Term it as literally well. is just a technical term that if you if you were a victim to a crime on the street. Everyone will say that you're a victim, but what's happening in your relationship, in your intimate partner relationships, or maybe it's familial abuse, um, or like so-called honour-based abuse, it's a crime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every single act of abuse is a crime that you are a victim, victim of. Too. That does not mean you're weak. It does mm. not mean that you're cowering in the corner. Like, not at all. Like, I was the complete opposite of that. I was strong. I was the breadwinner. I w ha was well-educated. Like, everything. Like, all the things that you wouldn't necessarily think of what we think domestic abuse is or a victim of a perfect victim of domestic abuse is I wasn't that yeah like I've always been confident I've always mm. been loud yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I've always been one to stand up for myself and yet there I was still a victim well, it's like, to um, the perpetrator Mel B you know Scary Spice she was a victim of mm. domestic abuse but she was like the loudest out of just yeah. Spice Girls and, and stuff like that so it's never there's even one from um, UFC this is it UFC or MMA, this female um, fighter, super strong, and she was getting 
abused by her husband and you're like oh I never think it's yeah, like you don't you know don't. the details of how yeah. it gets to that yeah, point yeah because when we talk about victims a we we attach this really like negative connotation to what victim means there are some victims that um never find that um kind of that way of regaining that power whilst they're in that relationship yeah, and yeah, there yeah. are victims that feel that you know like powerless like that in a relationship and they're never able to get control over them their autonomy again and then there are victims that will shout back there are yeah, victims yeah, yeah. that will act out in violence resistance like there are victims that will defend themselves mm. and because there are victims that do that they're not seen as the perfect victim right. so if you unless you're mm. carrying in the corner not saying anything back and just taking the beating both verbally emotionally physically that's the only time they see perfect victims yeah. So women like myself were never viewed as perfect victims and I never viewed myself as a victim. Anyway, eventually I was able to kind of get out of that mentality of what the word victim meant and actually just look at it a bit more objectively. What is happening here? And that was through therapy. Like, what is happening here? This is not me. I'm not perpetrating the abuse. Mm. Actually, my husband is perpetrating the abuse yeah. and he has been perpetrating the abuse this whole entire time I mean it was for eight and a half years it was the best part of a decade was he was he the one that recommended you to go therapy? yeah actually like, the irony is I was going to say he, it yeah, backfired yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the irony is was that um, it was very much like you know you're crazy you need to go to therapy and I did go to therapy because I was like I wasn't crazy at all and it was all him yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah it did backfire <laughs> because it changed my life like yeah. going to therapy was the beginning of the end and actually um, the re- one of the main reasons as well as why I went to therapy was it was right off the back of um a violent attack and it was the last violent attack um in the relationship um and i never talk about that attack publicly i've never spoken about the details um i've never spoken about the details publicly because as, as traumatic as the attack was it really was the immediate impact it had okay it was immediately it went from um like it it escalated really quickly after that so he attacked me it was it was a sunday it was after night out um and then immediately the next day he started taking my phone going through my phone but he'd never done that about the relationship and so it was like the the form the abuse took a complete turn right um and just got worse. So yeah, and he started taking my phone, started going for my phone, accusing me of cheating on him, sleeping with men. Um, and just it just changed. It felt more and more insidious actually, but it was more overtly insidious. Whereas up until that time he was able to hide it a bit better. It's, when you say overtly, do you mean outwardly? Yes, outwardly. Okay. Like it was more it was more the obvious signs of mm. abuse that you would look out for, the controlling, the going through your phone, the not letting you go on social media, all of that. Like it not, at that point. He was going through my phone, like I'd wake up in the night, my phone would just be missing, and he'd just be on it, going right, through my phone. Wow. I don't know what he was trying to find, so there was nothing on it. Um, and then it was, the family isolation started immediately, your mum can't see Bella. So he couldn't say that you can't see your mum, he would say your mum can't, your family can't see Bella. Because okay. he knows that, well, what, he knows, well, how do you expect me, like, if, my, if Bella can't see my family, what do you think that's going to do to the relationship I have with my family? He knew. Isolate, yeah, 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 exactly. He knew it would isolate me. And so those things almost overnight changed and got worse. Right. And I think he really started to realise that he'd lost control at that point. Um, and also because previously in the past, um, when he had attacked me and he was violent, it would be me saying sorry. Mm. And whereas this time... I don't know what it was, but I, after that attack, I wasn't sorry. And something just felt different. I was like, I don't want his, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it was. I just knew I didn't want his forgiveness anymore. In the past, I was desperate. I'd beg him, don't leave me, don't leave me, I'm sorry. And that really, truly is what gaslighting does. It makes you think that it's your fault and you will actually beg your abuser to stay with you. Um, Because that's how, that's the intentions of gaslighting, to make you think you're crazy and, and see, they get away with it. Do you know what? I had an experience with an ex who, oh, and I'm so glad I do this. You know, like I like to vent, yeah, mm. when something happens. I need to call someone. This has happened. I feel really hurt. I need to get it off my chest. Thank God I do that because one time my ex was saying something like, yeah, that didn't happen. No one saw it. Mm. 
basically you just made it up. And for a second, I'm like, did I? Like, did, am yeah. I just fucking seeing things? Yeah. Thankfully, I called my mate, who, when this thing happened at the time, and I'm like, I know it's true because I called her after it happened and was like, can you believe he's done this? To kind of reassure me, no, I'm not going bad. But, you know, like if I hadn't spoken to anyone and if you're living with someone and they're getting into your head like that, you are, it's not surprising that you're going to believe it kind of thing. And I've got like, I've actually got perfect, no, it's not perfect, but like I've actually got a really, um, I've got a lived, lived experience example of that. Um, when we were together, um, there was an incident where he went away for on like a boys' weekend. He came back, and I for, for wherever he picked me up from, I got in the car, um, and I put the seatbelt on. And as soon as I put the seatbelt on, I smelled perfume, and I was like, "This isn't my perfume. It was mm. super sweet perfume. I don't wear sweet perfume. Like I like more like fresh, like floral." zingy kind of scents right and this was proper tarts boudoir perfume <laughs> like it was proper night out perfume yeah, do you know yeah, what i yeah. mean like really really sweet and I, I i call my own perfume tarts boudoir like yeah. it's just what i call a night out perfume anyway so i put it on and i was like that's not my perfume yeah. like immediately i knew it was not my perfume so i do not own sweet perfume so i put the seatbelt on i said have you had another woman in this car and he was like no i said Smell the seatbelt. I was like, this is not my perfume. Well, I don't know. So I've not had enough woman in this car. And I was like, this is not my perfume. I'm telling you now, you've had another woman in this car. So it's not my perfume. And he was like, you're, he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you're going, you're going mad. It's always your anxiety doing this to you. Oh, using your... Yeah. And he literally... Oh, vulnerability. Yeah, like, literally. In fact, I spoke about this recently on some content that I'm doing, like, documenting certain things about actually the abuse and um my journey and things like that and I really went into detail about this incident and it all of these memories started coming back and I that incident is one of those ones that will stick with me forever because I genuinely thought I was going mad right and I thought you're smelling it or maybe it is my yes no no like how I thought how can he deny it's literally here? Yeah, like, it's, it's physical evidence. It's physical evidence is here. Like, how is he denying it and telling me it's all in my head and telling me mm. I'm crazy and it's my anxiety? And that, to the point where, because it was obviously really expensive, strong perfume, and you know how good perfume lasts for ages. And so I would find myself, what I would do, and this is how like crazy I thought I was going. We had like a morning routine where we'd drop Bella off to school and then we'd drop me off to work and then he'd go off to work, right? And I'd find myself running to the car in the morning. Smell it. Yeah. Just to smell the perfume. Just be like, is it still there? Yeah. Just be like, wow. like I'm not going mad. Like, this yeah, is yeah, real. Yeah. Like, I'm not going mad. Every morning for about two weeks, I could smell this perfume. I'm like, wow. I'm not going mad. Like, what? To why? Really keep reassuring yourself. Yeah. Like, like yeah. why is he denying this? Like, I can fucking smell it. It's right here. It's literal he's physical so evidence. Lying. And um, right. he's saying about the friend. I remember a friend of ours came over. Um, and we were having this, this discussion um, and I said to her, and it was around mental health and things like that, and I said, yeah, I said, you know what, like, I feel like sometimes I'm going mad. And he was there. And I explained the seatbelt situation. In front of him. Did in front of him. But I had believed I was mad. Oh, I had wow. believed I was making this up in my head. And um, so she witnessed that interaction when we were talking about the seatbelt. And how he was saying, yeah, you know, sometimes it's just, Lay's just crazy. Like, Lay's just, it's just anxiety. Wow. Like, sometimes, you know, these things just happen. And me and her talk about, because we're still really good friends now. Um, and me and her, like, have spoken about it in so much detail that she's like, do you remember that? Like, he actually made out, like, you were crazy. And I was like, thank God that you, you were there. there and you witnessed it. Thank God you witnessed it. Because she said at the time, when I was watching the interaction between you two, I thought, that ain't, so, that ain't right. right. Yeah, something's yeah. not right here. Like, no woman just makes up the fact that there's fucking perfume yeah. on the seatbelt. What are you going to get out of it? Exactly. Like, who would, like, what, five, six months before we get married, I want to know that you're, you've got other women. No. Nah. You know, like, you're seeing other women or whatever. Anyway, the long and short of it is, I'm, I wasn't going crazy at all. And I knew, now I know I wasn't going crazy. But when we, um, when I left um, and we eventually separated, I saw on his Facebook him becoming Facebook friends with a woman in the town that he was in during that last weekend. 
I was gonna say, did she have like on her information like DKNY no, or something? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I saw that, and I was like, put two and two together. Yeah, like so. Wow. I knew, like, and and so it wasn't a lads' weekend, or. Yeah. I have no proof that it was a lad's weekend, actually. Mm. I have no proof. All I have was his words, his and it, it, it doesn't really count for much. Do you no. know what I mean? Like, I smell perfume in the car, like, what are you talking about? And then when I leave, you're becoming friends with a woman in the town yeah. that you were in. So, wow. Yeah. And and it, they are these, sometimes it's hard to describe and explain to people how you end up with a perpetrator and not leaving. Um, because how do I tell you many multiple incidences like that that happened on a daily basis for eight and a half years? How do you no. unpick that? No. So I can't just say, when people ask such stupid questions, why don't you just leave? Like, what, have you got eight and a half years? Because, like, <laughs> so like, do you know, that happened, things like that happen every single day. I, um, after we got married, um, I took up bacon because literally the day after we got married, I fell into a deep depression. I know now why. Um, and he'd be like, oh my God, you're just always depressed, you're always anxious, like, find a hobby, for God's sake, find a hobby, like, I can't take it when you're like this, so I was like, okay, fine, cool, you know what, let me go find a hobby, started baking, useless at baking, I'm good at cooking, useless at baking, okay. anyway, um, started learning, like, how to bake cakes and cookies, and I found that I really loved it, oh. wasn't good at it, but I loved it, right, Therapeutic. and quite quickly, as an avoidance tactic, because I didn't want to be around him in the evenings after work, I would be like, oh, I'm just going to go to the kitchen, just practice baking. And not so not only did I love it, but I found that actually was an escape from him right. too. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was a way to get away from him in the evenings and not have to spend my time with him. Um, and then he started saying things like, oh God, you're always in the kitchen. You're always, we never spend time together. And I'm like, you told me to get, get a, a hobby. hobby that makes me feel good. You told me to do that. And so eventually I just stopped because I was like, I can't, can't, I can't be, uh, yeah, I can't win. I can't be asked. Like nothing I do is good enough because yeah. if I do what he tells me to do, it's either not good enough or I'm doing too much of it. And then it's taken, it's taken attention away from him. Mm. And so there was many little different things like that, that to the naked eye wouldn't necessarily seem abusive, but it's a pattern of behavior. And that's the thing about domestic abuse. It's, it's not the act itself, it's the intention behind the mm. act and the impact it will have on the victim. And so when people say things like, why don't you just leave? Well, how can I explain to you that bacon, in, that that thing around the bacon? Yeah. How can I explain to you the thing around the perfume? Yeah. Like, I, you can't, it's impossible to sit down and tell someone the whole ins and outs of what perpetrators do to the make their victim. Game yeah, perfect. absolutely. Um, I was going to say, about my first time going to therapy was when I was married and I was trying to make it work. Mm. And so I saw this this counsellor and she said, you sound like you're depressed. And I'd never heard of depression before. Mm. I was like, depressed? Am I? Because I'm always like laughing, cracking jokes. And I went home and I Googled it and I saw the symptoms and I was ticking all the boxes. I was like, oh my gosh. And it was actually helpful to hear it from a professional because it yeah. made me take it more seriously yeah. and then you can ask those questions right why are you depressed is it your environment yeah. is it this that and the other and then when things didn't work out with me and my husband she wasn't the therapist that I don't know I just didn't resonate with her as much and there was another woman who I actually first went to see for hypnotherapy to stop smoking and she um was really good at counseling me to move forward not dwelling on the past or or what ifs or anything which right. was what I didn't want I just right. wanted to move forward and she was really good with that um and I guess I don't know why but I just knew in my head you know certain people will try once and, and if it doesn't work it, it's done <laughs> that's but not how therapy reason, works yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just knew from back then like don't give up there's other yeah. ones out there you you just need to find your kind of is niche the right word? Yeah. Your, 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 I don't know, connection. Because when, in 2019, when I got diagnosed with um, PTSD, that's when I started looking for therapists again. Um, but this time I wanted, to, I researched for ones who are EMDR qualified, who are 
Don't tell me that's 1120. Yeah. Shut up. No, I'm not doing Oh too. my god. Okay. okay. Um, Don't lose your train of thought. Da, 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 da. EMDR. EMDR. So, yeah, so I would go to see different, um, so I was researching, speaking to different therapists like you was, but even some that I saw face to face, for example, the first one I saw, she had 12 years experience with Mm. rape crisis and I thought, oh my God, she's the one, she's going to be amazing. And she was, turned out to be really robotic, like, um, okay, when did it start? What's this? Blah, blah, blah. But just looking at me kind of like a statistic, like I'm a client, tick it off. Yeah. And I'd be like, so upset, hyperventilate, hyperventilating, because I haven't spoken about this shit that I've suppressed for so many years. And then she'd be like, oh, time's up. And there's just no see empathy you. from yeah, her. Yeah, see you number. next yeah, time. Awful. So within, so 2019, within the space of 18 months, I saw seven different therapists yeah. and only two of them made I saw real progress you really have to stop like stop. I got really lucky and I say this to people all the time and this is why I don't when people are like where can I find a therapist I don't really tend to give them advice on where because it depends on where you live mm. what kind of therapy you need um so my best the best advice in that sense is you have to do your research and you have to shop around yeah you absolutely have to because you have to find some kind of safety in the relationship and if your therapist has no empathy they shouldn't be a therapist at all. Yeah. They should not be a so, therapist. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why like, I, there's no way that um, the relationship between myself and my therapist would have been as successful and as fulfilling because there's so much empathy and compassion mm. in the relationship between me and him that it allowed me to build safety in myself. And I said to my therapist um, the other day, I was like, I feel so safe. There's something about you that I feel so safe. And he said, It's not me, it's you. But it's also the the relationship he's allowed me okay. to just let your guard be, down. yeah, let my guard down, completely be unmasked, and just be really genuine and true to how I feel, to who I am, and that's what I needed to build safety in me okay. and to connect with myself. And so, and I do, I find that a lot of people will give up on therapy because they just expect that instant connection, and it's not like that. Like it take, I mean, it's taken me my therapist five years and I'm only now just delving into childhood shit mm. and I know that one of the things you always ask me about um is about having a male therapist after having you know being grown up with a male perpetrator and then being married to a male perpetrator honestly it's it's he is the first safe relationship I've ever had in my entire life and he changed with a man, you mean? Yeah, yeah with yeah. with anyone actually okay with anybody wow And he changed my outlook on relationships themselves because often we think that relationships are just intimate, like Mm. they're like romantic, intimate partner relationships. But relationships are, they're about who you're friends with, your family, who you're romantically with, your children, like, I don't know, like the community, things like that. Like, and I had to change the way I viewed relationships. And I realized, oh, actually this is a relationship and what is being modeled between me and him is, is what I should be experiencing in the outside world yeah and within your circle yeah absolutely and that no doubt allowed me to then you know actually feel safe enough to be in a romantic relationship with Dan right to then pick like to see and unpick what was healthy in the friendships and what is healthy in my family relate my familial relationships and what's not healthy and what do I want what do I not want what's good for me what's safe for me how can I be a better person for other people mm. But if me and him hadn't have been able to build that relationship with therapy, I wouldn't. Have, I I think I wouldn't have been able to connect with myself and build that safety within myself. So it really I cannot stress enough how much you do. You have, you have to put in the work. Yeah. You have to put in the work in your recovery, and I say this time and time again. Every day, wake up and choose recovery. Okay. Every single day, because whilst what happened is not your fault, it's completely the perpetrator's fault. You are not to blame for that. You are not crazy for what you went through. You are responsible for what you do going forward. Mm. You are responsible of taking control of your healing recovery journey, whatever you want to describe it. And it is a fucking tough journey. Like every day is grueling sometimes. But coming to, like for me, 
And it's not linear as well. You know how we always say those. Mm. Here we go. Ready? We're using, we're using all, of, <laughs> all of um all of the buzzwords now, and it's and it, but it really is not linear. Like, and it's not overnight. No, and it's say. oh my god, it's definitely not overnight. Night, like as I say, like it took me five years just to get to this point of therapy where I do feel like I can connect with myself. Like I'm able to connect with my mum in different ways, and I'm able to look at things a little bit differently. Um, and my childhood. I'm only now able to start really processing my childhood and I'm 35, yeah. you know what I mean? After five years of therapy, only now I feel safe enough to. Have you started speaking to him about your childhood with ethnic cleansing? No, we haven't even got there okay. yet. No, this is what I'm saying. Like, there's so much, and that's why there is, um, like when we talk about post-traumatic stress, there is so much complexity in mm. trauma that my trauma doesn't stem from just one incident, that there's multiple, multiple abusive, violent incidents in my life, being a survivor of ethnic cleansing, genocide, um, being an asylum seeker into the country, not knowing any English, um, having to grow up and assimilate into a culture. that, that I neither belong here, but I neither belong back home. It's like having to find my own identity, you know, having this, like, grown up um, with a perpetrator of domestic abuse and being a victim from childhood, then being married to a perpetrator of domestic abuse, being with him for eight and a half years, but also living a compulsory heterosexual lifestyle for most of my adult life when I was really gay underneath. Right. Like, yeah. really? Like, there's so many different things yeah. that I hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm diverse, if not anything else. <laughs> I'm diverse in my trauma, if nothing else. Like, there's so many layers, layers to it. And that's why when we're talking about mental health and mental illness, it's a real thing. Like, yeah. it's real. Like, triggers, and we use, again, these buzzwords, I'm triggered, I'm triggered. It's like, actually, the impact of really being triggered um, from memories, from experiences, from scents, from smells, mm, Dan, anything. Dan bought um, a hand wash, a cherry-flavoured, scented hand wash to put in the downstairs toilet, and... I kept saying to her, I, was like, I don't like the smell of this. But her and Bella love it. It okay. smells like sweets, like cherry yeah. sweets. And I, said, I hate this scent. Like, every time I put it on, I want to throw up. And I thought maybe it's just because it's overpowering, right? So I thought it was just a bit of a sensory overload. And then literally the other day, I was washing my hands, and I got a whiff of it, and I thought, oh, my God. It's 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 the air freshener that he had in the car. Oh, yeah, like, like even now smell. I'm thinking about it. Like I can feel like I I can feel that the, my my oh, throat. throat yeah, like I, yeah, it's tight. Like I want to cry, and like I'm not gonna cry. But I but this is actually what a trigger is. And now, ever since realizing what that um, hand wash, what it brings up for me, and why I didn't like it, and why I've been feeling so tense lately, now I'm like okay I get it and now I can start processing this in a bit more safe way mm. ha having awareness has really changed the game for me I mean sometimes it's painful because you've got self-awareness you don't know what to do with it like it's actually it's like I'd rather so suppress it yeah, yeah. because <laughs> like, everyone's always like you're so self-aware I'm like thanks I might actually die from it one day like because having self-awareness is great can be overwhelming but it's as well. overwhelming when you don't know what to do with mm. it um, but I'm at that point in therapy where now I really can start to process these things safely and Dan bless her because she's just a fucking saint and angel yeah. Um, loves that. yeah yesterday we were both coming home like in different directions and she was in Sainsbury's and I went in and then she was picking up a different hand wash and I was like why are you doing that I was like it's fine like just keep I'll just go and use the one in the kitchen she was like no yeah. she was like absolutely not and she bought another one and that is the difference between someone who's safe and someone who is thoughtful, is, yeah, thoughtful and respectful. caring and kind and respectful, yeah. and they really take your needs into consideration. And it works both ways, by the way, in yeah, a partnership. Yeah, yeah, of course. But then that's the difference between having someone who's safe and allows you to process these things in your own time compared to someone actually who will make you feel like you're crazy. Yeah. Who will make you think you're going absolutely insane yeah. when you're not. Um, I just wanted to speak quickly and then we can yeah. uh, finish about my experience with a male therapist. So he was, um, I think 2019, EMDR. So he, so EMDR, you do eye movement, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. So he would put like a pen and do that in front of my eyes. But I remember I was sitting down and he was sitting over there, but when it comes to the EMDR thing, he'd come close. right close yeah. to me basically had his crotch in my face and be doing oh, this and yeah. I'd be thinking you're really close you're really yeah. close you're really close and then and it's not working because all you're focusing on is actually really something that's yeah and I'm sure he didn't 
mean it, but you know when it's like little things like, okay, Rochelle, do you mind if I come closer mm, to do this? Say. Are you feeling all right? Da, 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 da. In hindsight, I'm like, those questions would have gone a really Change. long way. And I've actually had um, a Krav Maga self-defense instructor. He, because um, by the way, my EMDR therapist, he knew I'm here for acts of sexual violence. Yeah. Like, a, a, come on, bit of breathing space. Yeah. Anyway, my um, self-defense instructor, I had like one-on-one PT kind of sessions with him. I thought, I know he's not a therapist, but he made me think like this is someone who's really trauma-informed because one time he said, okay, Rochelle, next week I want to try um, some floor work. Mm. But he was like, if that's okay with yeah. you. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? What's floor work? This is really tra- it's really triggering. Self defense is really tr- self defense oh, yeah, class is really triggering for survivors. He said, yeah. um because I was like floor work, whatever. He was like, It's when you lie down on the floor and I'm gonna attack you and I was like, Fucking hell yeah. <laughs> All right. But then he done it. Um but I I felt really safe with him and he'd done it so respectfully and he'd always give me a heads up. Like at, at one point it was like, Close your eyes and I'm either going to be in front of you or over there mm. or da, da 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 but just very communicative, very respectful and thoughtful. So, yeah, it does make a difference when well, you're talking Yeah, because he's taking your needs and, and the fact that you have been through something mm. that has completely changed and violated you, right, so you. Violated you, absolutely. And that's something that took your power and control away from yourself, took your autonomy away. And that actually is the difference between someone who who is trauma informed again another buzzword mm. that i have a big problem with because what does what does it mean when people say trauma informed like do you even know what that means like do you know like empathy. A therapist, <laughs> yeah like a therapist i think all therapists coming do. up uh, when you're a survivor of sexual violence which um i'm not so whilst i can i really can be like that sounds awful like i can't i don't know what that feels like do you yeah. know what i mean i can only imagine how actually it's just like triggering. a violation of yeah, Space. and the thing is, is when um when you are a victim of violence, whether it's um domestic abuse or say, sexual violence, with... it's the consent as well. Mm. It's the fact that perpetrators get off on the fact that they have power and control, whether it's through um rape or any other sexual act, sexual violence, or whether it's through abuse like um grievous bodily harm, ABH, whatever the forms of the, the any form of assault is. It's the fact that what they're getting out of it is they have complete control over you. Yeah. And power. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're a victim trying to recover and process all of this, the last thing you want is a bloke just crotching your face. Ah! <laughs> exactly. And actually as a therapist, they therapist I'm so shocked that um I'm not saying it doesn't happen, of course that happens, but I'm so shocked that there wouldn't be that awareness to say, is this okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a survivor of sexual violence is it okay if I come this close to you? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Mm. Poor practice. Okay, we can leave it there because my, um, okay, my one last thing, because I really want to include it in our forgiveness segment, is when Dr. Ramani talks about how she will never forgive. And this clip is exactly how I feel about my perpetrators. Probably I can think of a half a dozen people, narcissistic people in my life. I am now no contact with, some myself contact with. I don't forgive them. I will never forgive them. Really? Never. Even if you never speak to them again? I don't speak to them again. I will never forgive them. What they did to me, because what they, 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 it changed my view on myself. I spent years crawling out from under that rubble. I still doubt myself. I still don't feel safe in the world. They took away my safety. How the hell do you forgive that? I don't, and I don't, I, I sleep fine at night. That's good. I guess as long as you feel at peace, right? I feel totally at peace. Well, that's good then. Because yeah. what bothers me is I know they're out there doing this to other people. Yeah. How do you forgive? That's that? frustrating. That's frustrating. I guess the thing would be how do we find peace, even if we don't forgive? I think someone. if people who don't forgive definitely feel peace. Okay. I think people who don't feel peace are the people who forgive and keep getting harmed. Oh, that's Are the true. people who forgive and didn't weren't ready to forgive. Healing from narcissistic abuse is individuating becoming autonomous and ultimately rising into your authentic self that's what it is and your authentic self may not forgive and that's okay and people need to remember when it comes to survivors and post-traumatic stress especially for example people from my past who um say that i've changed think why have i changed 
because of the actions of my perpetrators. Um, you know, people say I'm isolating myself. Why am I still getting nightmares? I need to do more therapy. Um, why am I still so jumpy that I need to, uh, why can't I lose weight that I'm lazy? And I think you do know I didn't choose to have this life. I don't want to have any of these symptoms and trauma responses and high cortisol levels um, and chronic fatigue. So why would I want to forgive these people who cause so much distress and pain and change in my life? It doesn't make any sense. And also you haven't walked in my shoes or know how my body and my mind feels day to day. So I don't understand where all these opinions are even coming from. Just need to get that off my chest. <laughs> so thoughts on forgiveness. Do you believe forgiveness sets you free? No, I don't. Um, I think when we talk about forgiveness and closure, I think we've been fed this nonsense, especially as women, to keep us stuck in this cycle of trauma, of depression, of anxiety, a lot of times of abuse. Um, the way that I view it is no one else can ever have that much control over me again. So for me to say I need to forgive my perp in order for me to move on, or I need to find closure in the situation in order for me to move on, why the hell would I give someone else that much control over my life? And that power. Yeah, and that power. Absolutely not. First and foremost, you don't ever, ever need to forgive someone who has done anything wrong to you. Ever. It's nonsense when women are told, you need to forgive to move on. Why? Mm. Why are you giving that much power away to someone else? Mm. I don't believe that at all. I think it's more like an avoidant as well, like an avoidant way of not really dealing with the trauma that you're going through and processing. Say, yeah, like another coping mechanism. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like, it's like, a way to keep, and free Yeah, and I don't know who the hell came up with this. Like, it's a way of keeping women stuck in that yeah. cycle and of, of poor mental health. Of maybe... another form of suppression, actually, because it's actually true. But actually, I'm forgiving you, and I'm just going to shove it down here and not think about it you know i'm ever going to forgive someone who strangled me no no he doesn't nobody deserves that from you like if you're going to give that much of yourself and that much energy such as forgiveness forgiveness is a big deal mm. why are you giving it to someone who caused you harm yeah why would you do that i would never give that much energy to someone who caused me harm i will i Who's invest not i harvest and invest the energy in people who deserve it mm. the people who love me there are other ways of exerting that um I think when we talk about forgiveness, what we're saying is we feel like we're someone did us wrong. Okay. And it's true, someone did do you wrong. And you absolutely do deserve to find a way to process that and work through it. But I, for me personally, I don't think it's forgiveness. I don't think it's closure. I think it's some absolute nonsense that we've been fed as women. Like, oh, we need to forgive to forgive. No, I don't. Yeah. Like, I've done fine in my journey yeah. without forgiving. Like, I need that energy... For me, what I've done with it is I've just used it into love Moving for myself. Forward. Yeah, like yeah. love for myself. Things oh. that, things where <clears throat> I feel like need forgiveness is um, for yourself. Like I need to forgive mm. myself for the self-blame. I need to forgive myself for the shame that I put myself through, for all of the judgment that I gave myself. That's, that's, that's where the forgiveness needs to go. Yeah. It never, ever, I would never give my forgiveness to anyone who's done me wrong, right? It's it's for me to process and it's for me to say, you know what? None of it was my fault. Yeah. Forg I forgive myself for the way I spoke to myself. I forgive myself okay. for how much I made it my fault without it being my fault. Um but yeah, no, it's for me that's not that that ain't it. That ain't it. That is not the one. Well, because I've written so I think you can heal same, heal and move forward without forgiveness. I think it is a personal choice but it's not required mm. and um you know and if someone said that that they forgive it and it's and it set them free i'd respect that and i'd be happy for you like that's you as an mm. individual but i personally similar to you and also just because i i don't forgive doesn't mean i'm bitter no, and like holding okay. grudges because say for example um my exes or colleagues that have wronged me in the past it's like 
I'm on good terms with them mm. now, but I don't forgive them. Mm. It's like I would need uh, an apology, accountability. Yeah, but accountability. Showing yeah. genuine remorse. Yeah. Don't just tell me what I want to hear. <laughs> and change behaviour. Yeah. So, and the reason why I know all that is because with my sobriety, because I used to make a lot of mistakes during my um, off the rails years. And then when I became sober, I did apologise. Mm. I did t- hold accountability. Mm. And it's like, so I do believe those things are possible. Um, but you've got to genuinely yeah. do it. And, and that's, that's mm. what I've learned as well. I'm sorry are just words. They're just words. And you need the action yeah, to go. Absolutely. With it. And I will say this with to anyone about anything. If you are in a situation, yeah, where you're holding up, the thing about forgiveness and closure is dangling a carrot in someone's face. It's saying, Ah, here's the carrot. If you do this thing, you're going to be okay. Right. That's all it is. It's a dream. Like, that's what I think. And I know what you mean. Everyone it's a belief is, system. Yeah, like, like and everyone, right. you're right. Like, everyone is allowed to feel how they feel. And if they want to forgive and they think that's helped them, great. My belief is that I, it's not needed yeah, to move not, on, yeah. right? Um, it's that when you're dangling that carrot in someone's face, it's just, what is it? It's nothing. It's not yeah. actually real. None of it is real. Never ever just listen to someone's words. Always see how they follow through mm. with the actions. And that's for anything in life. Anything but in much life. more so when it comes to like abuse and violence. Yeah, yeah 100%. I, I, I will, again, I don't care how many times I say it, but perpetrators do, do not, not change. change. They do not change. Um, and then this, I wanted to share this quote from uh, Dr. Jessica Taylor. So being asked or expected to forgive your abuser as a way to move on is bullshit. Expecting or pressuring you to forgive is harmful in itself. You don't have to forgive anyone for anything. It's not required for you to be a good person, for you to work through your trauma, or for you to healthily move on. Lots of people process the abuse and never forgive. It's not a necessary part of the process. It's basically what we've been Yeah, it's basically <laughs> what, um, what it's, it's a big thing what you were saying, that just because I don't forgive doesn't mean that I'm here bitter. Like, yeah. I'm, I've been able to move through so much trauma and process it and really come out the other end and thrive. That does not mean that my survi- my recovery journey has ended in no means of that. Does it mean that? But um, Yeah, no, absolutely and, not. Like, yeah. you can, you 100% can thrive and move through whatever it is that you need to move through and, and process without falling into this trap of, I must forgive, I must forgive. Mm. Forgive who, bro? The man that strangled you? No, <laughs> absolutely not. I choose to put... I choose to put that energy, because that's, again, massive energy. I choose to use that energy into things that are deserving of it. Mm. And like you said, mm. that to yourself. And I know we just touched about closure. So I was just going to say um, something that helps me with closure and just giving it to myself rather than looking at for it from the person or mm. the perpetrator is I look, like to look at my life as in chapters. Mm-hmm. So when something hasn't worked out, I'm like, right, that chapter's closed now. I tried my best. Yeah, yeah. But let's keep it moving. Let's yeah. move on to the next. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, like, something that um I'm actually experiencing right now, for me, I realised that there's something in my life that is keeping me stuck and keeping me in a cycle of depression. And I had a moment towards the end of last year, like, you know, you know who's got the power to change this? Me. Okay. You know who's got the power to find closure in not going through this cycle constantly? Me. Mm. And so therefore, I need to make certain decisions to change my environment, to change this cycle so that I'm not constantly experiencing these, I mean, I can't really just call depression lows because it's depression, right? But I need to, I'm the one who's got the power to change it. Yeah. That's when I will find my closure yeah. because I'm putting the power back in my hands to create my own happiness. Yeah. It's not about chasing forgiveness elsewhere. Oh, okay. It's an unclosure elsewhere. Someone. Yeah, no, I'm the only one who can do that for myself. And leaving a perpetrator for me, and it, again, not just in my adult life, but in my childhood as well. For me, my journey is about how I find that control within myself again. Mm. Like when you've been uh, with a perpetrator, whether it's in your childhood or adult years, it's really hard actually to learn to trust yourself and to learn to know that you you're not going to fuck up that control yeah that it's okay for you to have control over your life it's okay for you to make certain decisions i have really big like doubts with myself like sometimes i struggle to feel confident with certain decisions i make in my life because i think i've never had this much power over my life mm. before so now i don't know if i'm what i'm doing is right, right or wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. and i'm having to learn right now that there is no 
it's not about it being right or wrong. It's about finding what works and what suited for you. Yeah, in this and what's moment exactly and what's suited for you. Yeah, it's about like analyzing and and managing the situation and looking at it from Weighing like an open. Yeah, look, yeah, absolutely, because it's not. It's never going to be a hundred percent right or, or like I'm never going to be perfect like that. I have to give myself that trust and that control to be like, you know what, you've got this. You're making these decisions. Trust yourself with it. Okay. Um. Oh yeah, and also I was going to say I think people mix up closure with being told what you want to hear. Yeah. So oh my god. Yeah. Totally. Hearing I'm sorry and the reasons behind why you abused me, cheated on me, stole from me. I don't think I would need no. that. Can to there move ever be on. a reason why? A reason that's good enough for why someone did that to you. And then to, for me to be satisfied and be like, oh, Can, no, and I this is why, it. and I'm really glad you brought that up. This is why I don't chase that because there is nothing that would, a perpetrator can say to me that would make me feel better or be like, oh, you know what? I forgive you. Yeah. I've got closure because how can anything a perpetrator says say justify strangulation, mm. justify a punch to the eye, justify being made to feel like you're crazy for nearly a decade? There's nothing that can justify that. And also, even with like emotional abuse or financial abuse, uh, da, 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 um. And again, not even romantic, it can be mm -hmm. family or, or, or colleagues, da da da. Um, it's like, what was he just saying? Da, da. Oh, yeah, I would be thinking, mm -hmm. well, you fucked me over before, you lied to me before, mm -hmm. how am I even trusting what you're mm -hmm. saying? You've probably Googled, right, like, how can yeah. I get out of yeah, yeah. this one? So even that, I and never underestimate me... people because they will do that. Yeah. They will do that. Yeah. But they how can I get out of this? <laughs> Closure is just you wanting a verbal explanation for something they've already showed you. Move on. So, yeah, hearing those reasons or whatever, an, an apology or whatever, it, I wouldn't say I need it, and I definitely am not waiting for it. Like, what, what, what excuse is good enough for someone to abuse you? Like, if you're trying to find closure, what excuse is good enough? If you said, why did you hit me? Mm. What the time I said, I wanted to. Because that really is the only <laughs> answer. To, that it's, yeah. a cho it's a choice. Someone who is abusive, it chooses to be. So there is no excuse of, for abuse. Like, the only cause for abuse is choice. And that's that. Yeah. Like, people aren't abusive because of their mental health, because of their personalities. Yeah. Because I know right now it's massive on social media. We talk about narcissistic abuse, which grinds my gears because it's thrown around like it's nothing. And it's actually keeping women more at risk and more at danger um because what so what if someone's narcissistic that's just like oh, oh okay that's why they're abusive no they're abusive yeah. because they choose to be and that's a narcissistic trait yeah like, that's not if there are abuse, I'm done. there are millions of people in this world that are narcissistic right and if if because i'm not going to go into this too much but if you studied psychology you actually what you realize is you have like your id and your ego and your super ego things like that that there is a part of everybody who has that trait. that trait yeah, yeah, in yeah. them. It's your self-inflated ego. It's part. Of, it's part of your makeup, right? But there are also millions of people who have narcissistic personalities. They don't abuse people. Yeah. They're just narcissistic. And I mean, is it pleasurable? No, not really. But then you just choose not to be friends with people like that. Right. But to actually say that, oh my god, it's narcissistic abuse. It's like, no, 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 it's just abuse. Mm. And I think if we actually stop talking about these buzzwords properly and what they are doing to women, it's going to help so many more women because what I'm noticing now on social media is the terms narcissistic abuse is taken away from the fact that actually it's domestic abuse. Mm. And if we keep not calling it domestic abuse, women are running the risk of becoming victims of homicide. Yeah. Because like, oh, okay, it's you're thinking it's, yeah, the, you're the, thinking the, it's the something that, yeah, 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 you're yeah. thinking it's the buzzwords instead of being like, this is domestic abuse. Are they a narcissist? Yes. But this is, as a whole, domestic abuse. And two women a week are killed by their current or former partner mm. because they're perpetrators. Yeah. So let's, we need to, I think, really start labelling it what it actually is. I'm not saying that these perps are narcissistic, that not narcissistic. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is stop labelling it that. Because Stop you're keeping other victims, yeah. Because yeah. you're keeping other victims at so much risk and danger of what can actually happen, and that is to be murdered by the perp. Because mm. you're taking away the term, the yeah, and, yeah, the whole thing. Um, have you had any negative experiences with therapy? Have I had negative experiences with therapy? Um, 
N- no, only the therapy that hasn't worked. Like, and, and <coughs> excuse me, like the, when I say negative, it wasn't negative. Just hypnotherapy just didn't work. Yeah. So I wouldn't say it was time. negative. It just wasn't right for me at the time. And also, I I really acknowledge and understand that I've been very lucky with therapy. Mm. Um, the first therapist I found, I guess maybe a lot of that is down to the research that I did. And maybe that's something that we need to talk about more, like as a community, to really research who you're going to hire as a therapist. But also, I've had the financial means. Mm. I've had the access to therapy as well. And I think the you know how I feel about like access to therapy and the way it's so inaccessible especially for Mm. women suffering from trauma it's one of my biggest bugbearers and one of the things that I really want to change with the CIC is to actually make therapy more um, accessible for women so I really acknowledge that I acknowledge that I've had really positive experiences and that might not be the case for everybody I know that a lot of women go through the NHS and they're given CBT, which is not for trauma. Mm. CBT and it's is six weeks or yeah, something. yeah, and and it's you can you cannot put a timeline on how much therapy you give someone who's suffered trauma. And again, going back to the point of EFT is working for me now, but it's only working for me because I've already done the how many part. years of therapy, yeah. right? And what I'm finding is um, talking to practitioners, the actual professionals who will tell you that these are like to EFT are like managing everyday anxiety, the things that you might not have the toolkit for. Therapy is to help you with trauma. Where, where yeah, and how to, from, yeah, and how to, exactly. That. Um, so yeah, so I really, I really, I get that I've been very, very lucky mm. like, for, for all of my positive experiences in therapy. Well, this That's is the thing is. is that people don't realise with therapy is that it's, you need to date your therapist like you right. need to build a relationship with them a lot of the the first thing a therapist will do with you is build that stability mm. that's the first thing they're going to do and then you work on building a relationship building that trust that safety you i think the expectations need should maybe we need to talk about the manage how we manage expectations around therapy you're never going to go to your first therapy session and be done yeah no absolutely not like even me even though i found my therapist like in the first time um Still yeah absolutely that. it's about creating that relationship that stability you cannot process trauma without that stability and that safety mm. with your therapist so yeah it does take a long time mm. absolutely therapy does take a long time and the more we talk about and have conversations like this and we talk about the reality and the expectations of therapy and the re- and what reality, actually happens yeah, yeah um maybe the more people will feel less scared to try I was gonna say or they'll feel open. if they have a bad experience like you like they won't feel so scared to try again again yeah, I know not all of them are like that. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, so because I've heard other friends talking about their their experience with therapy and feeling judged mm-hmm. and feeling. I've heard that a lot as well, yeah. and they won't go back, which mm-hmm. is completely understandable. Because at work, we talk about the um one chance rule. So you could be the first person that they could confide mm. in, um, and that's your one chance to show compassion. Because how you support them could be potential domino effect for the rest of their lives and how they reach out for support again so it is important and also I've seen a clip of Ashley Kane talking about not being interested in therapy um, after losing his daughter Azalea and it made me think of this status another Jessica Taylor she wrote I think we've made the mistake of believing it's pills or therapy but for some people therapy isn't the answer either long or short term for some people it's life-changing and for others it's not what they need instead they need something that looks like mentoring befriending volunteering learning reading coaching group work activities hobbies animals etc humans are so much more complex than pills or therapy and i just want to validate those of you that felt the therapy made you feel worse Therapy isn't always the answer either. And also, I'm going to show a clip now from the Wondering Room podcast where they talk about CBT therapy, the miracle question, and solution-focused therapies. He said to me, you know, we literally individualise the problem into the person and then we tell them to have CBT. And, And the thing about CBT is that the aim of CBT is to change the way you think about a bad thing so you stop reacting to it. Yeah. 
which is not fair in traumatic or oppressive situations. Fair enough, you can use CBT on something that doesn't harm you anymore, where you might want to change the way you think about it. Like yeah. phobias are a good, yeah. a good example of where CBT can work. Or like you might have, I don't know, anger sort of residual anger that you want to process and like change the way you respond in a situation you might say oh i've noticed that you know when i um lose control of something i get really angry and i don't want to do that no more cbt can be good for like changing the way you think in a situation yeah you can't fucking use cbt if you've got someone in front of you going i'm on minimum wage and my boss is absolutely vile to me and also i'm you know i've got debt collectors banging at the door and i'm being beaten up by my husband and my life is shit and they're like right so how can we help you think differently about yeah. this situation so that you can you know be happier and more in control and that's fuck off blaming, that's individualization it? but isn't that's victim blaming, yeah of though, course it? it is because it's not their fault and they are being subjected to all of those things so why is it that why is it on them to find the solution yeah exactly and also the way that it the, the thing is with CBT and the way that it's used is that it kind of like positions the person as your thoughts are irrational about this mm. and therefore you need to change your cognition and your behaviour behavioural responses to the thing. Yeah. Whereas actually I would argue as a psychologist and just as a fucking just a human um, that if you're fucking super anxious and struggling about all those things that I just listed, why do you need to change? Like, why are your thoughts wrong? Yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. Isn't isn't that a stressful situation wouldn't, to be in? Wouldn't the solution be, well, why don't we see if we can get you a different job or a job that you'd enjoy more? Yeah, or why, you know, why... Let's and obviously, help you get out of the relationship. Yeah, consolidate your debt, get out of your abusive situation. Yeah, you there's know. that thing called the, the miracle question, isn't there, as well? Yeah, I love using that word. But you have to use it really carefully and really sparingly. Yeah. But, like... The miracle question comes from solution-focused therapies, which solution-focused therapy, again, you can really misuse that shit, but also it's really useful in people. But one of the things... You can do this yourself, too, is, like, you just... The miracle question is um, a question that you ask yourself or someone else, and you say, if you woke up tomorrow and there'd been a miracle overnight and all your... You know, you you woke up and you felt totally better and, and you were healthy and happy and everything, what would have had to have changed overnight? What would the miracle have been that happened overnight while you slept? And often people sort of go quiet and go, well, um, I don't know, I I wouldn't be living here or um, I'd have a new job or whatever. Mm, And the thing is about the miracle question is that sometimes it helps people to get to the core of what it is that's actually bothering them without them having to do all the work because you can sometimes really naturally instinctively react to the miracle question like yeah. people have asked it to me like asked me before years ago and sort of gone well you know what would have to have changed in the morning uh, for you to like I, I don't talk about this a lot and you know I don't but like around body image and stuff um but like I remember being asked that and the and it would be like that I would wake up and look completely different like yeah and like that's not that doesn't mean that the solution is always real. Yeah. But it means that you can get to the bottom of what it is that is putting you in that level yeah. of distress. Yeah. Sometimes people are very distressed and they don't even know why. Yeah. Because they can't do the work around it yet because yeah. they're not ready. Yeah. And I wanted to know what therapies you've tried, but I guess you've already said that talking and yeah. EFT. Um, um, last question. What advice would you give to someone who's about to start therapy? Take your time. Really take your time. And um, as scary as it is, it's not going to be like that forever. Yeah. Um, and it's so hard. Like, when I think back now, for, it's going to be like five years. When I think back five years ago, when I first entered my therapist's room, like I said at the beginning, actually, what a nice way to close it, is that I went in thinking I was at fault. Mm. I went in thinking every, I was to blame and I was crazy. And in fact, it was a complete opposite. And yeah. all I needed was that compassion <clears throat> and that that relationship with someone else that allowed me to process what I was going, what, what I was going through, what I was feeling, my emotions. I'm so thankful to myself that I made that decision to go to therapy, mm. regardless of what my reason was to go to therapy. I'm so glad I did. Yeah. I'm so grateful for that old me that took that step. Yeah. That thought, maybe this is going to work. I don't know how it's going to work, but we're going to try it. 
take your time and if it doesn't work try again mm. you know that saying um i actually cringe at the same but insanity is like doing the same thing over and over again and having a different result right? right so if that therapist doesn't work find another one yeah. find another one well, like analogy time <laughs> yeah. I, we love, I think like as survivors yeah we love a good analogy don't we <laughs> um so i was thinking of it like a home renovation so you wouldn't you'd always get a quote from three different builders mm. before you choose one and then if you chose one and they're doing your kitchen but then they turn out to be unreliable there's too many delays Sack them and you find someone else yeah, yeah you're yeah. not gonna leave your kitchen yeah, you're half not, done right what you're gonna look for another exactly, contractor you know what? that is actually a perfect way to describe it you would not leave your home refurb half done no. just because of the shitty contractors you're not gonna live in a half done home no that's such a good analogy <laughs> I'll be able so to if anyone is listening to this, there you go. You would never leave your home half done. Why leave your mental health mm. half served? And I do have one more thing. Sorry, I do have one more thing I've about more therapy. Time. Is that um, therapy is not just when things are going tits up. Mm. Therapy is very much a safe space to process a lot. Like me and my girlfriend talk a lot about going to couples therapy because we are trying to find a way to communicate our emotions to each other without being scared. Okay. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong in our relationship. Mm. We just have got to this next step, this ne- next stage in our relationship where we're like, oh, actually, I'm really scared to, to, to be vulnerable sometimes. And even though I know you're a safe person, I still don't know how to communicate certain things to you. Yeah. So therapy doesn't, like going to couples therapy for me and Dan wouldn't be because there's something wrong. Right. It would be because actually we really we want, want to, to build on it yeah. and we want to grow and we want this foundation to be solid. We just need someone to just give us those skills and yeah, and that space. Again, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So therapy isn't just about deep it. dive childhood. Yeah, 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 yeah. Trauma, trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this therapy sessions I've had, I've gone into um to my therapist and it was laugh and joke and maybe yeah. that is just what I needed. And when time. I went back to therapy a year ago, um, my therapist said, "Why are you here? Like, what is it that you need?" And I realised that what I needed was the relationship with him. That what I realised was that I'd never had that safe parental relationship and he became that first one for me, yeah. that first blueprint. And I found myself like being like, oh, something good's happened in my life. I wish I could tell my therapist. Oh, okay, and yeah. if I need validation or if I just need that I safe email space to talk. <laughs> yeah. Listen, if my therapist, yeah, if my therapist did Voxer, like, you know, like voice notes, I would, I would pay him. I would invoice me every single month, <laughs> god damn it. And I've realised that actually I at that point I was going back because it was really safe for me and there was I didn't realise that there was things I needed to work through, but all I needed at first was to just regain that stability again. And probably it's nice to talk to someone who's understanding. And just sitting there and actually. Do you know how nice it is to talk to someone where you don't have to fake anything, where yeah. you don't have to mask anything? Be yourself. Like, I've masked for a big, big part of my life and I'm 34 and I'm only now starting to be my authentic self. Yeah. And that space with my therapist, I don't mask. I don't yeah. have to do anything that I don't want to do. And that that is really valuable to me. Yeah. It's Absolutely. so valuable because I just don't ever have to put on no pretense, yeah. no like, oh, I'm okay, I don't want to talk about it. I just go there and I just say whatever it is that but, comes yeah. out. <clears throat> um, I was also going to say, if you're on a budget, ask for discounts because a lot of therapists you can explain your financial situation and some of them can offer it to you for less mm. or finding new therapists who are building up their hours for their qualification yeah. they're usually at a discounted rate um da, 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 da. i was thinking as well try to work out what you want beforehand yeah i think that's actually a really good tip to give it's like i said that i did that research i didn't even realize until this conversation how actually that must have helped a lot mm. um yeah really do your research really research what is like that you think you need help with and then, and then see find your specific... yeah and then work around it and see yeah. if you can find the right therapist for that and also say you know communicate with your therapist and say I want to take it slow. Mm. I don't, they should be able to do that, but just, you know, if you're not ready to deep dive into childhood and stuff like that, you don't have to, yeah. do you know what I mean? Um, I was going to read... Oh, yeah, so talking about couples therapy, I heard Kerry Washington talk about using therapy as maintenance. Mm-hmm. So she has a PT 
for her physical health mm-hmm. and she has her therapist to yeah, help absolutely. maintain her yeah. mental health and well-being. It's been invaluable. I mean, for me, I've been in and out of therapy for the majority of my life and I was in a conversation with somebody recently where they were like well don't you think that's a problem like maybe you need a different therapist and I was like oh no like this isn't I'm not in it to be done like this is a gift I give myself. This is how I, like, the way I have a trainer for my body, this is my mental trainer. Because in my life, I'm always um, taking new risks. And and I want to be learning and growing. And so I want to give myself the mental and emotional support to stay in shape mentally and emotionally for myself, for my work, for my family. So I I love it. Um, Oh, yeah. And if you're on a waiting list for therapy, I was thinking... Call helplines like Samaritans. Um, I think, like in the meantime, yeah, I think when uh, what we what we also need, need to touch on just in conversations about mental health is actually the seriousness of where mental health and mental illness can take people. For example, um, just trigger warning: I'm not going to go into the details, but if we talk about uh, self harm or um, suicide, planned suicide, completed suicide, that they are really serious symptoms of um poor mental health and there are helplines there if you do not have that instant access to therapy utilize those helplines like you i'm whether it works all the time or not is not for me to say yeah yeah yeah. but if anyone is at that life state if you're at that point utilize please like i cannot even stress enough whoever you feel like is a support network utilize it and one of my biggest bugbearers is we keep talking about it's okay to talk it's okay to not be okay but then we don't actually ever tell people what what it's okay to talk about right but what does that it's okay not to be okay mean because if someone comes forward and they're they're telling you i'm suicidal how are you going to deal with it yeah how are you going to actually support that person we never talk about the what what it takes to really support someone yeah. through mental illness and mental health and especially through, through self-harm and um, planned suicide. Don't just tell people it's okay to be okay. You have to be that support and yeah. you have to realise that. Show like, that. Yeah, really show it. Like, really show up for the people that need and you. And even just be present. Because when I've been suicidal, just me crying and yeah. then in... And just someone listening to me mm. can help a lot. Because even just venting it, I'm like, I've got these thoughts, I can't get... Because sometimes I call them intrusive thoughts, because mm. I'll be okay, and then it'll pop in. But sometimes getting it off my chest will be like a lighter weight off my yeah. shoulders. We put so much um, so much responsibility on people who are, who are having a mental health crisis or just, you know, suffer from depression. We put so much responsibility on them to get the help they need but what about the rest of us that can help what well, about yeah yeah to actually offer the support like what is it that we're doing as someone support network to really show up for them so yeah. I, it's 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 not always just about telling the person like reach out for help reach out for help actually as check someone's in, village we in. also check in i know lives are busy i know it right believe me me more than anyone but you have to show up for people yeah. you can't just say i'm here if you want to chat listen if someone's suicidal it's not really a chat that they want yeah 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 it's like you say sometimes a lot of us have been there yeah a lot without saying too much a lot of us have been there and when i've been low what i needed was friends and my girlfriend to wash up what i needed was Mm. for them to take my daughter to school what i needed was for them to help me get in the shower for them to help me get out of bed i didn't need a chat because i wasn't in a chatty mood right i needed that logistical practical support So that I didn't feel like everything else around me was falling apart and therefore I should actually do this because look at me, look at my life state. Mm. So if you're going to support someone with poor mental health, really show up for them. It's not just about talking, it's about the doing as well. Gosh, that reminded my friend, um, Jen, she gave me this homemade soup the other day. And again, I wasn't struggling or anything, Mm. but even little things like that, because then the next day I'm like, oh, I don't have to prepare anything. Yeah, because depression is debilitating. Mm. Depression, I I know because I've been there so many times, depression is debilitating. Like, you don't want to cook. You don't don't want even your basic needs, like showering, getting out of bed. All I want to do when I have really bad episodes is sleep. I don't want to get up and do anything else. When I messaged you 
and you were talking about all the washing up and I was like, babe, I've got paper plates and plastic cutlery. Yeah. When I do not have the energy to do yeah. that, and I'm so using the, the paper <coughs> plates, you know, because I'm like... Yeah, and I think sometimes we get so consumed with what's online, with what's on social media, on like TikTok videos and Instagram, that we actually lose the fact that sometimes when, when depressive hep- episodes hit and they hit hard, because... For me, I describe my depression as something I live with every day and yeah. I manage it every day. And then episodes hit and they hit hard, right? Um, when those episodes happen, bro, I don't, I'm not waking up for no one. Yeah. All I do is sleep. And that's when I start to realise, actually, I'm falling into an episode because I don't sleep. Right. Like, I really so suffer from insomnia. Yeah, so when I catch myself, all I want to do is sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. I'm like, shit, I know what's going on here. Right. And thankfully, through therapy... I've been able to recognize, recognize that and acknowledge it and know my own patterns and my own cycles. And I'm not saying by any means that this is the answer for people. I'm not. I would never, ever, ever, ever downplay anyone else's mental health ever. This is just me saying mm. what, what is like my experience. Because yeah. I don't want anyone with depression or who's feeling suicidal watching this and thinking, oh my God, it sounds so easy. Trust me, like it's not that at all. It's just my, my experience has been that through therapy, and working through things with my therapist, really understanding what depression was, has helped me recognise the patterns, the episodes yeah. when they come. And the warning signs. Yeah, the warning signs for me have in the last two years have saved my life. Because you can yeah. be like, right, let me try and lift this in the bud yeah. now. Like, or... I think... I don't think people realise just how bad it gets. Yeah, yeah. And this is where I started to realise in the last two years that we tell people, talk, just talk, who to, bro? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and say what? What do you want me to say is that I don't want to live? Yeah, no one I wants to hear live. that. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear that. Because if you said that to someone, actually, what would the right response be? Mm. And that's when I realised the last two years that the help that I need for me was practical, logistical, and... I have to find that community, that that village that can help me with that. And it's yeah. not easy at all. It's not easy. But for me, that has been, it's, it's saved my life. Yeah. Like hands That's down, it saved my life. And I don't talk about this side of my depression a lot because for many, many reasons. Um, I just don't want anyone watching this who has been suicidal or has planned it or has attempted it to think that they're alone. Yeah, like, no, like absolutely. You're so seen and yeah. so heard. Like we get it. We just, are really shit as a society at giving people the safe space to talk about mm. it to be open because the second especially system systemically the second someone says they're suicidal they run the risk of being sectioned okay so if i went to the hospital today and i said i'm suicidal i'm having suicidal thoughts i'd be sectioned okay. i'd be kept in and i realized in, t- in 2012 really quickly that if i said that to someone i was going to be kept in hospital and so when you have poor mental health like that, you start to almost find, again, survival tactics. Can't tell anyone I'm suicidal. Okay. I don't want to be kept in hospital. Right. And especially, um, this is a big thing that I really want to touch on that I haven't really spoken about much, but as mums, when we leave perpetrators, we also know that we run the risk because if we say we're suicidal, it's very possible we run the risk of the kids being taken away from so us. Say, that social services. Services. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just want women watching this to know that they are so seen and heard mm. by me as a mum who left a perpetrator. I know how that feels. Yeah. I know how that feels. And there's, it's not a nice place to be in at all. Because I was thinking as well, talking about the help lines, and I said Samaritans, but finding one, a specific one, so for example, refuge, if mm. you've been subjected to domestic abuse and violence and or sexual abuse and violence, you can call the rape crisis helplines, mm. if there's something that you know specific that you want to get off your chest, yeah, sometimes it's better. There's also a lot of like really good grassroots organisations that do offer um, therapeutic services, and I think it's really important that a lot, we acknowledge that a lot of times survivors don't feel like they can trust big organisations, mm, okay. and we don't talk about grassroots organisations anywhere near as much as we should, because it's those frontline grassroots organisations that are, are, that are doing the footwork yeah. with on the ground with victims and survivors in real time. And so if there are people out there that um, don't feel like they can trust the big, the, the, the big organisations, the big charities, 
that just know that there are other organizations mm. out there for you and a lot of the stuff i post about on my instagram so if anyone wants more information please come to my it instagram. In the, um, yeah come to my instagram i literally and i work with a lot of them as well so i'm more than happy to signpost people if they want i think it's um when i say the big ones it's because they're the 24 7 yeah ones, absolutely yeah, yeah. and, and but yeah they have their place um, and they need because they actually have the resources as well they're the ones that get all the funding so definitely utilize good, it like, yeah when you said they're the ones on the ground like um oh yeah and i was thinking about therapists and helplines like it's they're professionals so they've studied to be able to help with your hardships so sometimes people might feel shame or embarrassed or scared that they're going to be judged so that that mindset helps me and also if it doesn't work out i'm never going to see you again yeah you're not part (laughs) of my social circle and also it helps me feel less personally less of a burden because I struggle with that Mm. and I struggle sometimes to contact even I've got an amazing support network sometimes I might think oh I'm sound like I'm fucking repeating Mm. myself Mm. so sometimes it is better to well I feel like that a lot as well (laughs) I feel like and I think for me why um (coughs) I believe that it's not just therapy alone that is life-changing and life-saving I believe that the formula is therapy community support and also actually gaining skills that you need in life to be able to function and reintegrate back into society or just be a functioning member of society as a whole. And I think that that, in my own personal life, living proof has been the winning formula for me. Yeah, it's so, not just one. Yeah, it's not just, I can't, and I'm so glad that I just thought of that now because one of the biggest things with um, LPTMS, with my CIC, is doing that, is trying to run the programme, um, the recovery programme, which is therapy, mm-hmm therapeutic interventions community support and life school workshops sometimes it's not just enough to have a therapy you need a village yeah you need that community support like i know i know hands down that the lbtms community has saved me Mm. more times than they know like they don't even know the half of it but having that access to the women in the community who just get it Mm. to women that i don't need to explain myself to like it's not enough sometimes to just talk to people because if they don't understand, then I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I know personally, I needed a community of women who understood, yeah. who knew what it felt like. I needed that connection and just know like there are communities out there. Like here we are, like LPTMS is a big, big community of, yeah. of survivors and Utilize it. Yeah. Uh, that's well, that's I've really... made friends for Yeah, your exactly. And you know what I love? Oh my God, I love so much it is when I see I women that I fi- Yeah, when I yeah, see yeah, women yeah. that I filmed in or women that like, and they're connecting with each other, they're becoming friends. And I love that they work with each other. Like, yeah. I love that. That's amazing because that is exactly what a community is. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, when I connected with Lou mm. and we were talking about past um, drug abuse and stuff like that, and it's sometimes it doesn't necessarily mean we're even talking about relationships mm-hmm. we're actually connecting on that level but it's so nice because like you said you get me when i'm talking about that yeah you get me. because it's um i think when you meet other women who have been through it it's just that i see you i hear you yeah and that for me is the biggest thing because the reason why i started lptms in the first place was because i found myself every i wanted to talk about it all the time back then but i I was bored of talking to my friends about it because they didn't get it. Right. I can't explain. I wasn't getting something, what I needed. I wasn't getting it out of them. And that's why I turned to Instagram for the support. Mm. And it's... Created this. Yeah, it created this massive ripple effect that I'm so proud of. But so, so, oh, thank you. But like, I am so proud of it. I'm so proud of the community as a whole. I'm so proud of everything we've achieved because a lot of us would have died without it. Mm. That really is the reality. Well, that's how I look at um, my colleagues as well, because sometimes it's not even me talking, sometimes listening to them, because they're survivors as well. So, for example, this one woman, she talks about her planned suicide and how she has all her paperwork lined up. And, da, da, da. Mm. and I'm like, oh, my God, I've got post-it notes on my paperwork. So I'm like, this is for this person. Mm. This is all cards, anything sentimental. But you're like, oh, it's not just me then. I thought I was going mad. Yeah, and this is why these safe spaces are so needed. Because then you start to realise I'm not alone. Alone. And actually I can talk to... This is the person I can talk to. This is the person that will get it. This is the person who maybe I feel like... I'm not going to be judged. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Um, 
Oh yeah, so uh, about feeling like a burden, it's good to speak to a professional. Also, I, my mindset, my outlook to them is they're being paid to listen or they're volunteering to listen. So they want to be there and help. So like you said, utilise the support and don't feel bad about yeah. it. Um, I just want to finish off with this from Dr. Nadine Macaluso. Do you know her? I don't think I do. So she, have you seen Wolf of Wall Street? Oh, she's the real life My wife, husband. right? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, ex-wife, yes, yes. So, yeah, I know who you're talking about. She says, a good therapist will be accepting and feel safe. At the heart of therapy lies the relationship you create and share with your therapist. A good therapist won't rush to diagnose you. They will approach you holistically and remain focused on the relational and emotional aspects of your healing journey. Many individuals have had negative experiences with therapy because they worked with a therapist who wasn't best suited for their needs. Finding the right fit is key. I love that. And that explains my relationship with my, my therapist. I was reading it because I wrote it yeah. before, yeah. but after hearing your story, I'm like, oh my mm. gosh, this is your therapist. Yeah, that is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Right, me, I. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, how exciting. This was, I love this. Oh.